Awesome. And I'm not going to embarrass myself by not remembering how to pronounce the name of your language, even though I've seen you do a couple of presentations on it now. But uh, I think we're all excited to hear the story of Tsa and how it's getting used in your language in, in I think, a unique way. So feel free to, to take over. Yes. So I just pronounce it scare as if it was an English word. But we're looking at uh concretely at the sounds uh which i'll actually refer to ts for most of this talk um but we could refer to it as the voiceless alveolar affricate we really want to get technical about it we might call it the uh voiceless anterior cornal sibilant affricate but i think this is um a sound of interest for many conlangers they either include it or maybe have at least thought about including it. Um, as it originally came into scare, it was uh, a bit of a happenstance thing that it got included. Um, this is because when I first started working on scare, I created a name for myself, um, which you saw maybe on the previous slide, Sketar, and at least based on the spelling, it looks like this sound is in there. Um, now, for many years, I was quite hesitant to recognize that this sound was actually there. So uh, for maybe the first seven years I had scare, I was going around telling people that the initial T was silent and then a little bit later that it was sort of historical. Um, but as I was uh, got further along in my undergraduate, I sort of reluctantly accepted that uh, TS should be a phoneme in the language. It's sort of around. I could have another phoneme that wouldn't be so bad. So I accepted it. Uh, now, fast forward many years, about 20 years later, um, I have been working with Scare for a, a while now. Uh, I was rethinking some things and it was pandemic time. And so I decided to investigate what really is going on with this sound and the languages in the world. And so this is a report on my findings. Um, so in this talk, we'll first talk about some sources of information that I use for TS. Uh, explorations, and some of these I think are excellent resources to use if you're a conlanger and interested in particular segments. Uh, we'll talk about some very basic facts surrounding the phoneme TS, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the apparent different kinds of phonological systems you get with sibilant affricates, which include TS, and then I'll wrap it up by talking a little bit about what uh, my explorations led me to sort of decide about scare. Uh, so when I first started conlanging, the go-to source for looking at this sort of thing, phonological inventories across the world, was something called UPSID, which was short for the UCLA Phonological Segment Inventory Database. Uh, but in the 21st century, there are now several large online databases that you can use to explore this sort of thing from the comfort of your own home and on your own computer. Uh, so there's something called FOIBL, um, which also originally had an acronym attached to it. Uh, there's also something called LAPSID, uh, which also is more or less uh, an acronym. This stands for the Leon Albuquerque Phonological Systems Database. Uh, there's interestingly also a similar sort of research that is regional in its scope. So it's something that I'll call SA FON, um, and the SA uh, stands for South American, and it just looks at the patterns in the South American languages. Now, all of these works uh, are based on phonemes and reported phonemes because they're all at least secondary sources. This means they have some problems sort of inherent to talking about 
phonemes. One is that the information they report sort of obscures uh, anything interesting about allophonic variation. It also doesn't go into maybe that much phonetic detail. And I do happen to think that this sort of thing is probably interesting and potentially relevant. Uh, but I think that these online databases are sort of good enough for the purposes that I put them into here to just get a feel for what's going on. And so they're fine. You'll see that I chiefly make use of Foible and SAFON, uh, partly because I think they have, well, especially SAFON has decent user interface. Foible is great because it has tons and tons of information. Uh, so from Foible, you can look at the uh, sort of frequency of particular different segments and uh, they report that TS is found in 22% of the languages in the database. If you actually look more closely, you discover that Foible is actually happy to have multiple descriptions of the same language in their database. So it's really 22% of the language descriptions in their database. Uh, but this makes it the 26th most common consonantal phoneme. Um, so this means it lags behind its component parts T and S and is even a bit behind the fricative sh. Um, it's also behind its fellow affricate, uh, still in affricates, ch and j. But it is ahead of some things. It's ahead of the fricative j. And perhaps most intriguing it's actually far ahead of its voice counterpart, Z, which actually occurs the significantly uh, smaller number of languages than, and I'm not sure that anyone has a great understanding of why that is. Um, also from Foible, you can see uh, some indication of its geographical distribution and looking at the maps that Foible can generate, it's clear that TS is common in certain areas of the world, what I will call hotbeds of TS. And so some of the hotbeds include Central and West and Eastern Europe, um, Central Africa, the Caucasus and the Himalayas to mountainous areas of Eurasia, uh, Southern East Asia, which is basically China just north of what is Southeast Asia. Um, the Pacific coast of North America is another hotbed, as is Mesoamerica, and finally, um, at least for this list, uh, Northwestern South America is another hotbed. So besides just looking at sort of uh, how often it appears and where it appears, I think it's also interesting to see how this behaves within phonological systems what other phonemes accompany it? Uh, do other phonemes not accompany it? That sort of thing. And to sort of skip to the chase, it seems that there are relatively few systems of series of sibilant affricates. Um, maybe just four. Probably you could count them at least on fingers of both hands. Um, and one of the reasons why the number is low is that I'm talking about series. Uh, so essentially I'm talking about sort of the number of places that uh, there are sibilant effort gets in the language and this ignores some things like aspiration, uh, whether there's any glottalized things, that sort of thing. Um, and I'll go ahead and use the voiceless sound to exemplify any and all in the series in large part because the voiceless sound uh, almost always is present. So it's at least sort of right there. You're mentioning one of the advocates that's in the language. Um, it's interesting co to compare sibilant affricates with sibilant fricatives. Uh, so sibilant fricatives have been an area that people have been looking at fairly closely for the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so. Um, 
that research does suggest that different siblings kind of repel each other in perceptual or articulary space so they don't bunch together very close in place and they're usually quite separate and that same sort of thing seems to be going on with sibling Africans too what is different uh from uh sibling fricatives is that sibling Africans actually have more than one uh single sibling uh series system it seems that sibling fricatives if there's one it's usually some kind of uh but if there's one African, there could be a couple of different possibilities I found. Um, so the numbers of these systems are kind of arbitrary, but what I'm calling system one has just a back sibling affricate, usually ch. Um, and uh, this is familiar because both English and Spanish have this system amongst other languages. Um, and it actually isn't something that I want to dwell on a ton in this talk because there's no TS in this system, but I felt that I should mention it because uh, it is fairly common. And just looking through SA FON, I found it in 34% of the languages surveyed there, and I think it likely is the most common type of sibling aggregate system in the world, though some of that's a little conjecture. There is a second uh, sibling aggregate system that has a front sibling aggregate and a back sibling aggregate, prototypically t and ch. Um, and this is found in lots of languages. I decided to uh, go with. Tetzal uh, as an example, and you see the Africans right there. This is a list just of the language's obstruents, and you see that there are some uh, ejective ones, but that doesn't really matter because we're looking mostly at place. Um, so I found that system two was found, uh, or occurs in 21% of the languages surveyed in SA Fawn. And I think it is uh, reasonable that this is, in fact, the most common system that includes TS. So probably the path of least resistance, if you were really uh, just making the average language, would, uh, and you want to include TS, would be to uh, use system two. Um, interestingly, there is this paper by Nikolayov and Grossman uh, that looks at Africans worldwide, and they come up with an interesting similar percentage for languages that have two places for Africans. So it's maybe possible that the percentage from SA FON actually is reasonably close to what the worldwide distribution is of this particular system. System three has just uh, and this is maybe the most interesting one if you're really focused on this particular sound. Um, this is found in Cantonese. You see Cantonese's obstruents in this chart, and you see there's only Africans, though there's a difference between a plain one and an aspirated one. Uh, this occurs in 9% of the languages in the SA FON database. So I got the sense that this is uncommon, but not rare. Um, it occurs more than a few languages, but it's definitely not the most uh, popular uh, pattern out there. I was curious, sort of, how common might System 3 be? And uh, I don't have a complete answer, but I did sort of hunt haphazardly uh, to find other instances of this, and I found it in about 30 other languages, most of them, in fact, from the hotbed areas that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so it does seem that this is out there, but it's maybe not as common as System 1. System 4 has three different uh, sibling African places, a front one, a sort of central one, and a back one. 
and this what occurs in Polish amongst other languages out there and in Polish uh the Africans come in voiceless voice pairs um this doesn't occur that much in the SA fawn uh database only in three percent of the languages uh there um it does seem that when languages sort of go all in with Africans, which in fact is the kind of language that Nikolaev and Grossman were really interested in, um, this does appear uh, in languages of that type, because in fact, a big part of their paper is looking at this particular uh, type of system. If we're doing some typology, we do want to think about implicational universals. And the only one that I found is if you have a phoneme TS, you have a phoneme T as well, though this is not particularly exciting because lots and lots of languages have the phoneme T, so maybe not the most profound uh, thing that I discovered here. Um, I did look at sort of uh, some other interrelations between the sibilant affricates and the sibilant fricatives. Uh, so there are a few languages with uh, TS, but no S phoneme. Uh, this occurs in 4% of the languages in SA phone. So I think this is an option. Um, I also was curious if there are any languages that had TS, S, and SH, but no CH, this sort of uh, asymmet or asymmetrical system. And this occurs in a few languages. It's not particularly common, but I think we can say that it exists. Uh, this also got me wondering, well, are there any languages that have TS and SH and nothing else? And it seems that there are a few languages of that, though, again, it occurs in uh, precious few, at least within SA Fawn. So my searches of the various database suggest that quite a bit is possible. And uh, even if I kept TS and scare, which I really wanted to do, I could have gone with a number of different systems. And uh, so it was still kind of up to me, but what I really uh, sort of gravitated towards is, oh, I'd accidentally created this rare pattern. I'd already made, scare a system three language and realizing that this is kind of rare i sort of wanted to double down on that so i definitely was like well the one thing that this uh gets uh one thing that's evident is i need to keep scare as a system three language and the subsequent uh and ongoing thing that i've been working on is sort of how exactly do system three languages behave which um I've made some headway with, but probably could learn some more things. And the following slides are just a collection of different references and uh, other sources that I've consulted in doing this research. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, that was a whirlwind tour which is actually really interesting because we we do see a lot of languages um a lot of conlangs that if they want to be a little more exotic we're looking at those rare sounds even though uh 26th in the list probably isn't the the most rare i, I should look up myself what uh the uvular voiceless fricative is i'm sure it's way down there i think it only it appears in four languages or four dialects or something like that uh we ate up our question time, unfortunately, but I would encourage you to hop over to the, the YouTube chat if you, if you want to have a conversation over there. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing that with us and uh, giving us a little bit more insight into Scare.